Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I am Ray, your humble. Well, I, I kind of at least hope I'm your humble audiobook reviewer. I try to be. I try not to, to get too full of myself. Uh, but that's hard. That's hard because I've got kids who think I'm just amazing because I fooled them really well. Um, anyway, uh, today I'm going to be reviewing some current and classic audiobooks that are lit RPG based in that genre anyway. Uh, but my first book, the very first one that I'm doing today, is The Accidental Dragoon. Not Dragon. You know, at first, when I first saw this, I thought, oh my gosh, Carrie becomes a dragon? What? What? Uh, that's JTJ, Justin Thomas James. Uh, that's his saying, so I won't steal that, but that's where I got that from. But no, it's, it's Dragoon, you know, so anyway, it's part of the Accidental Champions series, the trilogy, which is really the Accidental Hero series, part two. So it's the second trilogy of the Accidental Hero. It gets kind of confusing, doesn't it? Um, anyway, it's written by the ever-amazing Jamie and C.J. Davis, uh, narrated by Stacey Gonzalez, with a book length of 11 hours and four, count them, four minutes. Captain Carrie Dix stood over the long dining table in Captain Crandall Weldon's estate, looking at the expanse of charts spread out across it. She stabbed a finger down on a small town west along the coast of Tandon. Can't we land here? Crandall shook his head. No, oh, the Dix's forces are spreading out across the western reaches of the Empire. The Imperial naval forces under his control are blockading each of the ports, as they reach them, and he has situated land forces along most of the approaches to Tandon. Well, we've got to find some place to land. We can't stay here forever. Carrie's eyes scanned the map in front of her, and then looked at the other charts showing different portions of the western coastline of the Empire Phantasma. There had to be somewhere she could get ashore safely and begin transporting Crown Princess Jacy to her great-grandmother, the Empress. So, I just really, really have to say, first and foremost, that I think the Davis family knows how to pen a tale. I have to admit that I love their first trilogy, but the accidental part was kind of getting a little old by the third book. Honestly, I enjoyed the third book in the first trilogy, but it felt, uh, I felt a little bit more rushed and forced than I think about in the manner that how was a, well, the way he was able to acquire his powers and abilities in just a really short amount of time for the final showdown against the Emperor. Uh, the end of the trilogy doesn't feel like that at all this time around. Uh, I think this time it's, it's really focused, it's tight, uh, it's, it's got a really great pace. I mean, the narrative is, is fantastic. Um, and, and I just think the Davises, like I said, they know how to pen a tale. I think they're such really great writers. And I, and I think somewhere down the line I'm going to do um, one of their urban fantasy novel series um, the, the, the EMT thing, they, they deal with monsters and stuff in the middle of the night, uh, which is a really good series. And I'll probably do a, what else have they done? Probably not really soon, but maybe five or six episodes away, uh, which is a win-win for me because I just did Robert Scarlato and Scarlato narrates that series as well. So I get to talk about the Davises and Scarlato all over again. And if you don't like it, um, I'm sorry. I just think they're like really great. Uh, together, I think they go really well together. Uh, Scarlato and the Davises work just just fine for me. Um, but anyway, the end of this trilogy just it really really sung. I think it's it's just a such a step up from the last series. Uh, it's just incredible because I hadn't gone into this series expecting to like Carrie or wanting to even like Carrie. I was a big Hal Dix fan. I think Hal was really cool. I I, I just liked him a lot. Uh, and getting his daughter thrown at us was kind of like, nah, I don't know if I want to do this. It went against all of the, the instincts I have as a reader because once you, you start into a series, you kind of fight against, you know, changes. And changes are not always good. Uh, sometimes, you know, what works the first time around works the second time around, and it works the third time around if you know what you're doing. I mean, you look at Jim Butcher. The guy has 17 novels in the Harry Dresden series, and they're all the same book. You know, there's not, like, massive shifts or changes or surprises. I mean, things happen, but Harry's still Harry. No matter what happens, he hasn't shifted all that far from one end of the pendulum to the next. He's right where he was before. Uh, just things have occurred. And, and you can't radically alter things all that much, especially in a trilogy, going into another trilogy, and I, I think that they kind of upset my apple cart for a little bit. I was kind of very, very against starting into the series. 
I'm so glad that I didn't listen to myself because I love this series so very, very much. Uh, now, some of the things I think that really work on this series is the fact that uh, Carrie kept her class all the way through the trilogy. You know, uh, even though she sort of became a dual class or maybe a triple class, I don't know what you would say, um, but she was not only a duelist, but she was also a sailor and a captain and, and well, hell, she was a pirate, but like the good kind, like as in a privateer. Um, Carrie really, really exceeded how as a hero. I mean, she went through a hell of a lot more than her father ever did during his own stint in Phantasma. Um, you know, Hal did a lot of stuff. But Carrie really went through the ringer in, in, in a lot of different ways, much more emotionally, much more physically, um, mentally. There was just a lot of crap that happened to her uh, that just really stood out and, and showed how much more evolved she was than Hal. And that's not to get, again, that's not to say that Hal isn't a great character, but Carrie really, really lived in these three books. Uh, and she was much more realistic. And I think it demonstrates just how much the Davises have developed as writers getting up to this point. And again, the story does not slack on the action or the intrigue or the emotional devastation that occurred in book two. I, I think this time around, it's even more inflated, um, you know, as in as there's more action, more intrigue. Um, and there were, uh, there was one little thing, and I'll get to that, like it, it kind of, bug me a little bit, but this time around, Hal and his wife do more than just, you know, than they have in the first two books where they're kind of looking for her. So it was nice to see Hal back in action. Uh, but the one thing, like I said, the one thing that really just kind of bugged me was I really wanted to see Carrie um, go into uh, more head-to-head -head against the Duke's men. Um, I wanted to see her duelist abilities used up more. Uh, the whole dueling aspect was pretty fascinating uh, from the start, and I would have certainly liked to see more. I mean, after the first book, when they were showing her her options, like, you know, like, whatever they were, it's been so long, I can't remember, but let's just say it was saying, like, Paladin, and, and you know, uh, let's say Bard, or whatever. I thought, well, hell, with the second book, she'll come back, and she'll be a Paladin next time, or something, and it'll be even better, because as much as I like the duelist, what can't you do with a Paladin, or something along those lines? But she stayed with that class it didn't shift even though she added more stuff to it and gained different abilities she was still at the end of duelist and i wanted to see more of that ability used because it really just felt like she was running from people for about 75 percent of the book she was just like run away run away we'll, we'll get back to these guys later later on i'm gonna kick your asses and that's just kind of how it, it just kind of felt for me the whole way through the book now it didn't really take away from the story, but it would have improved a bit if she had done some stinging before the end of the book. Um, thankfully, even though they do close out this chapter of the trilogy, I think there were a few things, you know, left as breadcrumbs for them to follow if they ever wanted to return to Phantasma. So, you know, I don't, I don't think the, the accidental whatever you want to be next time around, if it's going to be the accidental hero or, you know, the accidental, um, you know, paladin. Um, I think they can come back to that and do more with the stories. And this is one of those rare kind of books where, as the writers were not completely afraid to scrap the old setting and magic system and redo the whole thing for the new trilogy. Um, and I, I keep referring to the whole trilogy because this is just kind of like everything you would expect at the end of the trilogy to be. There was stuff that was set up in the first two books, and those kind of come to a conclusion. And I don't want to tell you what they are. I mean, when you read a book, you're going to know what's going to happen because that's just kind of what has to happen. Um, it's just a matter of how does it occur. Um, and so I am going to say, like, you know, this, this is being part of the trilogy. Here's what I thought was really awesome about it. Um, they scrapped... Everything from the first series uh, in the ways with how things were done. So, you know, the first set was more like a medieval setting, uh, standard, you know, swords and sorcery type fare. Uh, the new setting with Carrie included cannons and muskets uh, and made a nice change of pace. Honestly, if you want to know, you read so many lit RPG books where they're all set in the same kind of fantasy setting. Um, it's, either, it's either fantasy or super advanced sci fi. Uh, and Neri, is there anything more? Like, this feels more like the lies of Locke Lamora meet Little RPG. 
Uh, if you don't know if you've ever read Lies of Locke Moore, the first book is fantastic. The other two after that, they kind of go downhill in quality, and I don't know why. Um, but this is what it felt like. I, I really said the series is the Lies of Locke Lamora, but with the, the, the gaming system included. And, you know, I just think it was really great. Uh, one beef that I did take is that I do get disgruntled when I see how science is always somehow ousting magic. You know, when the world gets starts getting science, then the magic starts vanishing. It's kind of like gunpowder overrides fireballs. I'll never understand that. But it's not my world. These are world mechanics I just can't get behind. Because, like, hey, I like magic. But this was not a problem here. And in fact, it made it feel more, and, and I mean this in a very sincere way, more like a stat and skill-based game rather than one of mystical powers. You know, in the first trilogy, you know, Hal's first thing was he was the thief. And then after that, he, you know, he was a fighter. And th those two things were the same way. It was basically... He wasn't getting magical powers, but he did get certain skills. Here, um, Carrie had dueling powers, so it, it, it did not feel like she was going out of her way with magic. It was just kind of like, I have this ability with my sword. And, and that was really, really cool. Really cool. Um, so I like that about this series a lot, that they kind of step away from the traditional you know, of gathering powers and magic and things like that as you go through and increasing your abilities. And she really kind of just kind of said to hell with focusing on dueling. I'm going to do other things. So that's why she became a captain. And, and you know, everything that she did um, was not about making herself a better duelist. It, it just wasn't that, that wasn't the case, which is shocking because that would be what you would expect. Um, and, and that's what I loved about the series. And at the end... That's the one thing I, I think it lacked for me. And I'm not saying, again, it's a negative way because I really like this book a lot. Um, I would have liked to have seen the dueling stuff a bit more throughout the book than what we got. Because in the first, in the second book especially, it was kind of less used than I would have liked. Um, the first book, she was getting her legs with the dueling and stuff like that, so you can understand why it was there. second one, it wasn't quite as, as dueling environmentally rich as I would have thought. Um, and this one here... I think we should have had like the dual power coming up more and more and, and juicing her, you know, a lot. Uh, but again, um, like I say, this is the last book and seeing those new skills used in new ways, like sailing a ship out of a rocky shoal. Um, that was really interesting in the second book and, and things like that happened here. Um, so I just want to say, you know, even though the dueling wasn't used as, as much as I would have liked, it still was good. It was a really nice, nice little tale. Um, again, I'm going to praise Stacey Gonzalez, who's made this a very, very fun series to listen to. I felt like she captured the spirit of Carrie Dix very much uh, and embodied her vocally. She also kept a deft hand at the helm of this series. And there's no pun intended. I know that you know Carrie was a pirate. Um, and, and again, kudos to these guys for tossing in all the... the Throughout the whole series, the, the, the references to The Princess Bride. Um, one of the greatest films ever made. I have read so many books about it. Uh, watched everything I could about the making of it. Uh, the, the story and the movie fascinates me. William Goldman, just he's my hero for putting this thing to paper. Um, so anybody who gives a little bit of a tribute in any way, shape, or form, they deserve a nod and a tip of the hat. So there you go, guys. Um, you deserve something. And, and you know, Stacey Gonzalez kept that all alive. She, you know, there are certainly emotional moments uh, that get your blood pumping. Uh, and, and that's just like in, 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 in the, the Princess Bride itself. There are moments that are touching. There are moments that are like action packed. Uh, there are moments that you hold your breath. And, and she does that very well here. I really had that that atmosphere of, of that movie coming through. There was that fantasy appreciation. Um, and I, I think that she just really nailed that down with her narration. So hopefully, if, if Carrie returns for another series, um, great, Stacy's available. Get her and use her. Uh, and if you guys really want to fool me and go with somebody else, I'm just going to have to trust you because I, I think that you guys know how to conclude a, a series. Your writing has only gotten better. And, and I'll be there with you guys no matter what you decide. So whether it's Carrie or Hal coming back or both of them or somebody completely new, I'm all on board for the accidental whatever. Um, my final score is going to be 8.4 stars. 
would have been a little bit higher, but like I said, I wanted some more dueling done in the book um, and less running away from the, the Duke's guards um, than there was. I think it was just a little bit redundant at the end. Like, it was like, run away, run away, run away, now we'll fight. Um, but that's fine. It was still a really fantastic story. 8.4 stars. Okay, so next up is Freehaven Online, Lady Thunderbird, Into Hades, a lit RPG adventure by June Prince. Narrated by Amy Landon, which is in the Freehaven Online series, uh, with a book length of 12 hours and 55 minutes. A little over two weeks trapped in virtual reality, and I sometimes think about my body. I'm still alive and don't feel mind fogged, so I can only assume that someone's found my lifeless husk back in Meatsville, slumped in my beanbag chair, and that now I'm on life support. Whether I'm occupying my old bedroom in my parents' house with an IV and a private nurse in some sort of improvised ward for company employees at HQ, or in a regular hospital with all the coma patients is anyone's guess. For now, I'm still breathing. Staying connected to Free World Online this long messes with your head. You remember the real world, but with each minute that goes by, you begin to think of the game environment more and more as your real home. It's like taking a long vacation, when on day 12 of 14 you think, do I still remember what working's like? Of course I do. But with NPCs acting more and more like real people and our guild chef, Param, cobbling together more tasty meals, this place feels more like an actual location than a bunch of code stored on Freehaven servers. So the Toxic Muffins are back in this follow-up to the Freehaven Online Dragon's Bane. Uh, and I have to say, if you, you like muffins, it's okay if they're toxic. You can, you know... I don't know how you, you want to dis discuss tasting those. Uh, I, I could eat a toxic muffin, but I don't think I could eat a moldy muffin. So just stay away from moldy muffins altogether. Toxic ones, you know, you could, you could nibble it and, you know, maybe throw it up a little bit, but you'll get through it. Um, but this, the toxic muffins have returned to people. That's the important thing to remember. Uh, now, this book picks up roughly where the other one left off, with one team member dead from sacrificing herself or themselves. I don't want to give away too much. Um, the team is still trapped in the game, and they are not happy about it. Um, as before, they all have their reasons for wanting to get out quickly, but obviously, that ain't happening anytime soon for them. Um, that doesn't stop them from trying to find a way out. However, it soon becomes clear that they have a chance to save their lost friend, Amire. Um, now, you know, that was like one of those things where uh, you kind of maybe saw it coming at the end of the first book. There was a lot of lead up to it. Uh, and I didn't think that they were going to be able to do anything about this. But this book kind of says, hey, there might have been some potential for saving someone. So the team then has to fight their way through Hades in order to retrieve their now deceased guildmate. Now, along the way, they do the smart thing, and they add some new members to the Muffins, which is both, I guess it's it's a positive, negative, it's a boon and a hindrance, um, because, you know, when you add in some new members, uh, there's always some strife and tensions that kind of come from within and without creating some tense situations and dire consequences. All good stuff. All good stuff. And I have to say that I think this book is much better than the first novel. Um, it does approve, <coughs> excuse me what came before, and it really, really hits home. I liked the Greek, Greek mythology bits a lot, and I felt that the story was properly humorous when it needed to be. And that's not easy to do. It's, it's a hard time, it's a hard thing to balance. Uh, and humor, believe me, is very hard to nail down. Either you, you either get it, or you're completely off base. I mean, it's just, there's, there's no two ways around. Either you're at, right at the bullseye, or you are a quarter of a mile away from the target altogether. Um, so getting that humor in there where it is, it works, and, it, and he does a really good job with that. Um, not every writer, like I say, can hit those marks to lighten up the story, <coughs> excuse me, periodically. Um, now, by the way, this isn't all Greek mythology stuff. Um, Prince does toss in some of his own bits of imagination and even some Thailand lore as well. Um, it doesn't clash at all, which is surprising, uh, but it flows very nicely. Um, you know, like I say, it, it's, it's kind of like... I always look at it when when you have like uh, like let's just say the Percy Jackson's Rick Riordan uh, stories where you got the Greek mythology and then you have the the, the North mythology because he has other books uh, and I, and I have read those books to my kids so yes I know what I'm talking about um, they they don't mesh well together like Greek mythology is great for Greeks and Norse mythology is great for you know 
people of the Nordic descent and in that area up there where it's nice and bitter cold. But they don't really mesh well because the Norse people have a very different lifestyle than the Greeks and their gods are very different in attitudes and happenings and things like that. Um, and so when you take two different mythologies and smush them in, into one thing, I, I never think it really works well most times. And here it does. So, you know, kudos to, to June for getting that aspect right too, which is not easy. It's really, really not easy at all. Um, but he does it. He does it. And one thing that I liked about Prince's style is that he doesn't believe every problem can or should be solved via fighting. Um, and that's that kind of goes against most of the little RPG audio book or I guess just plain general books uh, way of thinking because there are tons of games out there where the whole point that you play is to crush your enemies. But there are still a goodly amount of games that, you know, also favor thinking and puzzle solving. Uh, sometimes, you know, smashing and slashing or puzzle solving or both. Um, in that respect, he kind of reminds me of KT Hanna and her Somnia online series where the protagonists often find that fighting is usually a secondary or even tertiary option. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't fights, and but you also get quests like appeasing uh, Charon, um, the boatman, that you rarely see elsewhere, okay? Uh, one thing I would have liked was, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but maybe a recap or some better refamiliarization re of the cast. Um, I know, I know. while I know the MC pretty well, uh, just because of the way the story started the last time around with her brother missing and, you know, she he's dead and she's combining things and doing stuff. Um, I would have liked to have seen just a refresher so, so I could get got brought back up to speed with the characters because, I, honestly, I didn't remember them as well. I, mean, I go through a lot of books, and I think if I had just read this book and then had read a couple others in the interim, I would have had a very clear memory of who everybody was. But I go through, you know, numerous books in a week um, and I, mean, I can't can't compare to Ramon because Ramon can read and I'm listening so if a book is 17 hours I'm listening to it for 17 hours he can take a 300 page book and I'm sure devour it within three hours I mean, it would take me roughly that long or less to do a 300 page book um, so you know he can get through a lot more than I can uh, because I have to listen to every single word that is spake and, and so um, I I don't have the ability to recall everything that gets said or done in the story sometimes. And I kind of have to go back and, and look things up just to kind of remember what happened in the story. Now here I did remember the story itself, which tells me I liked the story a lot. Um, but the characters I didn't recall as deeply as I did the tale. So, you know, maybe a recap would have helped a little bit just to help bring me up to speed or the other, other readers as well. But it, it worked without it. You know, you kind of just kind of get back into that saddle and by about the fourth chapter, you're like, okay, I remember this is the guy that was like flipping out because he needed to get away uh, and so on and so forth. In the way of narration, I believe that I like Landon works, Landon's work even better uh, this time around than I did before. I definitely hear improvements. I, I think that I felt before that she had lacked emotion during non-dialogue parts and her reading style kind of threw me off a bit. Um, here she has improved her pacing and isn't just spitting out lines mechanically in between people talking. Now her reading um, did make it a little bit more difficult for me to connect to the characters and therefore the story itself. Now, however, she has improved in those areas and I had a much better time this go around uh, than I did before. So I hope to see her continue to improve. I, I think that her 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 if, if before I would have said, and I don't remember what I gave her, but let's just say if I said she was like at a six, I would probably say she's at like a 7.5 at this point for her, her reading ability as a narrator. So she's really jumped a lot in a short period of time. Um, I can also see improvements on Prince's end of writing as well. Uh, he clearly put a lot of thought and work into making this book even better. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, and I, I, I try not to spoil anything or get anything, give anything away. Um, and I don't want to tell you whether they succeed or fail. Uh, and that's that's half the fun is finding out, isn't it? Um, so here I'm just going to leave it. You know, the, the story will continue. Um, but um, it, it's not what you expect. Because like I say, there's there's a lot of different things that come into play in this, this book that you don't see coming. Just because, you know, he has curveballs lined up. You know, when you have Ty 
mythology with Greek mythology uh, and, and some of the side quests they get hit with. It's just really bizarre stuff, but it's fun stuff. Um, so my final score is going to be, and this is an improvement too, is going to be 7.9 stars. Uh, both the writer and the narrator made some strides, uh, making this much more fun and exciting. I can't wait to see the third um, because I think it's probably going to be even better. Uh, I, I think that you know if she can get her, her narration improved even a little bit more, tinker with it, nail it down, and he can he can do what he did this time around and, and just add a little bit more jazz, man, this is going to be a killer series. Um, I, I think it has gotten better as time has moved on, and, and that's a good sign of a, a writer who's evolving and learning. Uh, and I think Gene Prince really is doing great with that. So 7.9 stars. Uh, if you go back and look, I think the last time I gave like a 7.2 or 7.4. So there's been some improvement, uh, clearly. Uh, just a few little nitpicky things that I had that I just kind of trimmed it down some. Uh, but it's a really good, really good. And I think I think that uh, if he, he takes a, a nice measured pace and goes through this, uh, and, and just kind of adds a little bit more backstory to what's going on when the book starts up. I think it'd be really great in the third book. So 7.9 stars. So next up, I'm doing my sound booth spotlight. Yes, the sound booth spotlight. This time, I am going to do the Last Warrior box set. The Last Warrior. Of, I'm going to goof this up. The Last Warrior of Unagia, Unagia. I, it's by Harmon Cooper, narrated by Jeff Hayes and Annie Ellicott, and this is the last Warrior series, books one through three, with a book length of 18 hours and 17 minutes altogether. There is nothing to be afraid of, Auric Rune. The obelisk says, her voice the buzz of a million crickets. Her large eyes have fly-like qualities, reflective and closer to her temples than to the bridge of her nose. Where are the others? Wolf and Sam! I keep my weapon trained on the obelisk, if that's what she really is. Unigaya's main AI? Impossible. I suddenly feel delirious. My hand trembles as I swipe my splintered sword in front of me. <sighs> Answer me, damn it! The obelisk is next to me in a flash, staring out at the lagoon with her disco ball eyes. I jump back as more vampiric mermaids rise from the water. My weapon disappears. I go for my inventory list. The option is no longer available. The obelisk turns to me. Please relax, Auric. I've called you here for a reason. So here we go. Here's another book that I can't pronounce, either the name of the author, the narrator, or this is the book itself. And I apologize to Armin Cooper for this. I try. Uh, I listen to the books and it doesn't mean a thing because I can listen and say uh, J-U-N looks like Jun. And 90% of the time, I will say Jun Prince rather than June Prince. But I struggle to make myself be able to recall these things. And the name of your series, I, I called it The Last Warrior just because that's how I remembered it. I was like, we're going to do Last Warrior 1, Last Warrior 2, Last Warrior 3. Um, because I can't retain... How to pronounce things sometimes it, it does not look right for my tongue to go so i apologize with that but another harmon cooper book with more coming i still have like house of dolls to do and another something or other of his to get to in the next few reviews so you know keep an eye out for him um you know harmon cooper is one of my favorite authors um I, you know i have a lot there's just lit rpg is just rife with oh excuse me Lit RPG is just rife with incredibly talented writers. I could I could go on, and I'm not going to do it because I could just start listing writers, and I could do the same thing with narrators, and I'm not going to do that because I will leave somebody out unintentionally, and I don't want to do that. I really don't. Um, but you know, Lit RPG is so full of talent; it's scary. Um, and when I say Harmon Cooper is one of my favorites, I really, really mean. He's, he's one of my favorites. Uh, the guy can write a story. He has got the humor aspect down. Uh, very few people can make me laugh or do a spit take. You know, I always say, 
you know, Justin Thomas James is the only narrator that almost ever killed me with his narration. And that's the truth. He really came close to <laughs> killing me uh, permanently because he just did this awesome narration. And he, he, Harmon Cooper is probably the only guy that I listen to that makes me laugh out loud on a very constant and consistent basis. There have been points where I have laughed for seriously 20 solid minutes when I've listened to like a feedback loop novel, um, just cracking up, just cracking up. And so, you know, when I say he can do this, the man knows how to write funny stuff. He also knows how to write serious stuff and he knows how to write sexy stuff. So, you know, I, I don't think that if he puts his mind to it, there's nothing he can't achieve with a pen or a keyboard or whatever it is he's writing with. I don't know if he writes with his telephone, but he, he's, he's a really talented guy. Really talented. Um, and, and so this, this is a three book collection of something he's done, which is a pretty, pretty cool deal for the average Audible listener. I mean, you get three amazing books for the price of one. Now, I never understand why an author would be so nice as to collect three books into one set when they can make more bread selling three different novels for the same price. I mean, if you think about it, the book is 18 hours roughly in, in general, like 18 hours and a couple minutes over. So it's roughly a six-hour book each time. If you break it down that way, each book is six hours. There are a lot of authors out there who have numerous books that are five to six hours at a pop, and they make a nice, decent living from that. And they don't collect their books into giant collections. Why would you? You, you, you leave those books for people to buy individually. Um, and, and Cooper, you know, I don't know what he's thinking because I'm a mercenary capitalistic dude. I'm in it for the dough. You know, I'm, I'm there for the money. Uh, you know, it seems, you know, like it, it's a bad capitalistic model. Now me, I would throw in a short story for, with the three extra, three extra stories that he did, you know, three extra books and charge a little bit more for what he's got going on. Um, just because I might be a coward, but I'm a greedy little coward. Uh, some people might say that this is like, you know, this attitude's all about the Benjamins, but for me, it's all about the Woodies. Okay, you can laugh. You can laugh when I say it's all about the Woodies. I give you that. But Woodrow Wilson is on the $100,000 bill. Now, you might say to yourself, well, the, the $100 bill was the highest legal tender, or maybe you could, you could even say maybe the 1000 but you're wrong. You're wrong. They may no longer make the $100,000 bill, but they are still considered valid legal tender. And if somebody hands you one, take it. Take it. Woodrow Wilson's face is worth far more than a Benjamin. Far more. You know, Benjamin Franklin is an awesome cat, but if I had my choice, I want Woody. Okay, it's all about the Woodies. So I want a pile of those, not the Bennies. Bennies are for suckers. Give me a Woody any day. Oh, wait a minute. That didn't come out right. Neither did that, damn it. Okay, I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. Uh, and I'm going to get to, to Carmen Hooper's awesome set of books. By the way, what really makes this a special to me is the fact that this is the first book in the series that is the official Sound Booth Theater production. Book one is the very first time, I do believe, now if, if I'm wrong, Jeff Jeff Hayes can come on and correct me, but I do believe this was the first time uh, that SBT had its own banner and was no longer Jeff Hayes. It was the SBT uh, company that did this. Uh, so it's a, it's a special, how could I not do a Sound Booth Spotlight on this collection because it's got the first book ever done by SBT in it. it really does so you know here's my question to you do you know what I love to see my enemies driven before me no that's not it um, what I love is an author who isn't afraid to make a trilogy nowadays it seems like everyone everybody wants to make this open-ended world where they can play in perpetuity you know, yeah, I, I like, you know, Harry Dresden, but they could have cut the books off, you know, like after book nine, you know, done three trilogies, just crunched up everything and done it in three, three different trilogies. And it would have been a great book series. Um, we're on book 17. 
were, were very delayed on books uh, from that point. Um, but what we need is is just a conclusion to the story uh, because you can tell there's there's getting to be writer burnout with with Jim Butcher, and trilogies let you close it out and then come back to it later if you need to. Uh, you know, I think of George R. R. Martin and his <laughs> it will end but it will never end Game of Thrones series. You know, oh, it'll come to an end one day. I think he'll, he, it will end when he dies. That will be the only way. But until then, he's going to be writing a thousand words a day. Yes, he writes a thousand words a day. Yeah, I, I write a thousand words mostly per review that I do. And it doesn't take me all that damn long to put a thousand words to paper so that I can come in and tell these little segments. Um, so yeah, he, he's, he's taking it slow. And again, like I say, there's no end in sight to Harry Dresden stuff. Too much time passes between each project and with no real end in sight, the poor fan has to suffer and hope the series will see some love from its creator and get completed at some point. Cooper plays as smart. He sets up a trilogy that is self-contained, but is also set in a shared universe in which other events and people have taken place. The Proxima universe. Uh, you know, Quantum Hughes, Feedback Loop, that place. Um, so you keep your setting and you get different events and characters. More importantly, he concludes his story. So yay. Yay for this consideration. Cooper uh, takes an unlikely character, a player killer, and makes him into a hero. Now this is really hard to do because, I don't know, I, I know Dave Wilmarth hates player killers because he has written some stuff about player killers and he's loving kind uh, in his depictions of them in his books. I myself just told a story not too long ago about how I hate player killers. I'm not a PK person and I, I hate PK in games. I think it's just ridiculous that you would even include that kind of crap into a game. Um, so uh, he takes a PK and makes him a hero. And that's hard for me to get into. Uh, but you know, it works. It works. Now, this PKer, his comrades, especially Raid, are really great and make for a fun adventuring party. Raid! Uh, the man can craft a tale in the way that Da Vinci would slap some paint on a canvas. Yeah. Yeah, Da Vinci did paint, and he just slapped paint on No, he made masterpieces. Now, what comes out is a simple tale of revenge in the way of a PKer uh, seeking drachma killers and... Uh, turns into a tale, of, a tale of suffering and sacrifices and betrayals and he, real heroism. Heroism. Heroism or is it heroism? Uh, I don't know. Um, you know, and, it, and it's, it bounces between the real world and the game world really effectively. And there's this sibling thing going on. I mean, the, the book is really just, the whole series is just thickin' fun, you know? Um, as I said, Cooper smushes three books into one, so I'll just have to gloss over some details and provide an overview. Is book one any good? Well, Mr. Cooper hits all my criteria for his amazing story. Great characters, check. Check out the Goblin. Okay. Uh, plot, check. How about the problems in the real world and the VR game? All there, baby. All there. Um, we have to struggle with strife in both the real world and the VR. Is there plausibility? Now, this isn't one of those books that touts how great the MMO is and is sweeping the world. And then you look at it and you think the mechanics that are detailed in the story would never work and the game would never sell. Um, it, it's, it's very believable and plausible. Um, it is out of left field, on fire, and moving at the speed of light, much like my beloved Feedback Loop series, uh, which is all set in the same universe as I said, Proxima. Uh, the series is just packed with fast-paced action and humor. Now, I've said it a thousand times, Cooper's humor gets to me. Um, you'll love book one, and thankfully here, book two comes right behind. And then book two, the heroes are back, and they plan on taking out the source code bomb. Oh, I don't want to be to spoil anything. Uh, anyway, they, I said it, so they're, they're taking out the source code bomb, and they just seem to kind of do it a, at a bit more leisurely pace than you would think. Um, and I think this is probably the weakest part of the series in itself is just kind of like this uh, almost relaxed attitude toward getting things done. It was kind of weird because it was as much as it was happening in book two, uh, as much fun as you were having and things like that, 
it just felt kind of like, well, we'll get there when we get there and do what needs to be done when we get there. Uh, you know, and this isn't one of those books that isn't full of action, like, you know, some rat bag, son of a biz does die, uh, you know, because someone does die. And you will literally feel like every stab in the heart that you think you will feel when the one person dies. Yeah, I mean, when they pass on, you're going to feel it. Right here, right here in the, in the heart. You're going to feel it, and it's going to hurt. And you're going to want to cry. But don't cry, because you're a man. And men don't cry. Not in this family, they don't. And if you start crying, I'll slap you. So if you read this book and you start crying, let me know. I'll drive to wherever you're at, and I'll give you one of those just to make you man up. Just, just saying. Just saying. Anyway, no ficking joke. Uh, the story has a lot of depth to it, and Cooper is a great storyteller. He knows all the buttons to push uh, and the right time to hit them, and that's that's not easy to do. Uh, I think this is not a by the number story by any means, and it keeps the RPG aspects alive to a point that you think that this genre has been around forever. Uh, I just think that, you know, the only part that was kind of... It was slow. There was a, a slower mentality through this book about getting things done. Not that the book itself was a slow, uh, but the characters just did not have an urgency about them that they should have had. Um, now, what a way to end the, the series, okay? Book three, revenge isn't easy and loss is hard. The heroes suffer and sacrifice, but we get the big boom we have been waiting for. And it's well worth the wait. Uh, the story is much faster paced than in the previous book, and you'll probably need to stop the book just to catch your breath. I mean, you know, if book two was leisurely, uh, this book is going from I'm jogging a half a mile every day to I'm running the Boston Marathon um, with a wall of fire chasing me going about 18 miles an hour, and I have to keep ahead of it. So, you know, it, it does kind of eh, bump up the pace just a little bit, just a little bit. Uh, it, it's a roller coaster. If I said, you know, it was a roller coaster, it, it wouldn't do justice as a scripter. Uh, there are times it will break your heart, and you might just find your heart healed. Uh, you'll probably need to stop the book, like I said, a couple of times just because. I mean, there, there are feels that are being hit as you go through it. So watch out. Now, Hayes and Ellicott just crush the narration. Now, I have no, I've never had qualms admitting that Hayes is my favorite narrator. And everything he does just slays. And he totally kills it here again. Annie, his accompanist for this duet, proves first and foremost, and very much right at the beginning of the, the uh, start of Sun Booth Theater, that she can stand side by side with a master like Hayes. And not only hold her own, but push him to do a lot better. Uh, they work really well together. Hayes and Ellicott really put their all into this performance. The emotion is real. At least it feels that way to me. Um, seriously, these folks should get a Grammys for their performances. Uh, the combination of their vocals and Cooper's writing makes for a nitroglyceric... Nitroglyceric... Is that right? Is that a proper name? Is that a word? Nitroglyceric, like ghost, nitroglycemic, nitroglyceric. I don't know. Uh, it's a nitroglyceric combination of words that are dangerously volatile to your mind. Got me? Okay. So, beware. They will move you. Their words will move you. You will feel sad, and you will feel touched, and you will laugh. They will make you do those things against your will. So beware. Uh, so my final score, after all this incessant rambling, and it just seems like I never stop rambling anymore, uh, is 8.3 stars. Um, the story is really good. You do get some people, you know, from the one series kind of sneaking in. I don't want to say too much. Uh, but they kind of come into the series here a little bit and do some stuff uh, before moving on. So it's nice. It was really nice. I like I like the way this, this series was, was cared for. Uh, it was nurtured really well. And, you know, I'm hoping, and again, I don't know how far he's gotten with the writing of the feedback loop um, because I only do audiobooks. 
I don't know if the, the loop series is completed yet or if it's not. But if it's not, I would like to see some of the characters from here end up in there and doing some things. Because it would just be nice to get them back and, and doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, because it's, it's a good story and they're good characters. I enjoyed it a lot. 8.3 stars. All right, now I, I'm going to say this right now. I apologize, uh, but I'm going to do a few of what else have they done in the next few weeks. Um, I do have Game Worlds that lined up, and I have a Is It Lit lined up. But I think that it's important to kind of give back to the community sometimes, to the narrators, to the writers, so that you don't just see the one thing that they did in the lit RPG audiobook stuff. I keep saying audiobook, but then the lit RPG books, um, because is is fun as lit rpg is it's not the end all i just say it be all of of, of storytelling uh, it is probably one of the best genres out there but there are other genres that you can support um because every now and then you need a break um and and these are the people that you want to go to when you need to break so this week on what else have they done i'm doing damnation robot galactic demon hunters by Aaron Crash, who you may know from the War God's Mantle with James Hunter, uh, narrated by Bob Dunsworth, uh, with a book length of 10 hours and 18 minutes. One less monster in the galaxy. A job well done. And now, the spoils of victory. The Burnett and his arms had been key in helping them capture their prey. The sparks hadn't been there at first, but Blaze knew how to fan a flame. Kiss me again, the woman whispered. The twin suns beamed off to Cater 5, the giant gas planet filling the window. Since most of the swirling clouds were red, Blaze's room was cast in a scarlet light. Damn, she smelled good. She must have perfumed those hard abdominal muscles, so different from her soft, squeezable hips. Too bad he couldn't remember her name. Not for the life of him. He bent and kissed her, enjoying how soft and wet her lips were. She opened her mouth wider, offering him her tongue. Who was he to say no to a lady? So, as I said, gang, I'm here doing another What Else Have They Done segment, and I do plan on doing more Is It Lit and the other things, but um, we, we just need to, to feed this community a bit more. Uh, to that end, I'm going to focus on a guy that is best known his association with James Hunter uh, and his collaboration on the War God Saga. Now, you want to know the truth. Before I had read War God, I was kind of annoyed by it. Why? Why would I be annoyed by something I hadn't even read? Because it was taking precious time away from my VGO series back then. Um, by the way, I, you know, I kept thinking, how dare James Hunter do something else? How dare he? And you know, it was still lit, still lit, but it wasn't VGO. And 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 I I got really really crabby. I'm like, how dare this guy who's doing this awesome series step away from the awesomeness of VGO? To work on a book like, you know, War God's Mantle. I mean, what's up with that? Um, I was pretty attached to VGO back then. By the way, I still am. But um, I have learned to be a bit more open about other ideas and bits of work that isn't lit RPG. Plus, I do believe that I owe this to Aaron. Because I don't think I ever mentioned him, not once, in my online review of the first book of the War God series. Now, you might be wondering why I didn't focus on his American Dragons series, and this is no reflection on it at all. Um, the fact is that there are a lot of books in that series that are out, and I just wanted to bring some attention to this one book, even though it's going to be in a, a series all unto itself, but there's just one book for this moment. I think we should just stand back and let this be talked about all unto itself for now, uh, because the, the American Dragon stories are going really well. I don't think they need me to come up and sing their praises or, or give them a Yahoo and a boost or the thumbs up. I, I think that this is something that uh, needs talked about. And I've had this book in my collection for a long time, but I have just not been able to, uh, I, I have listen to it and i just have not reviewed it and i try not to post anything until after i do this show um and i had planned on doing this with aaron crash uh just so 
you know, he would get the spotlight that he deserves because I, I feel that, you know, he, he's always kind of right there with James Hunter. I mean, people used to think that Aaron and James were the same dude. Seriously. Uh, and James could say, no, no, I'm not Aaron Crash. And people are like, yeah, yeah, we get it. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We know you're on Aaron Crash. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> it was kind of humorous um, that people would refuse to believe that, you know, James Hunter would not admit that he was writing under a pen name like why would you give yourself a pen name and then write together with that pen name as a collaboration it didn't make sense um, but people refused to believe that aaron was his own person so take it for what it's worth um, anyway i'm going to talk about the book now i'm going to stop chatting about craziness um, damnation robot starts off in the very very thick of it um, there's explosions and gunfire and lots of battle stuff happening so you know this isn't going to be one of those books that takes something like 10 to 15 percent of the book to get into the meat of things i like that i like when a book jumps in over its head into the deep end of the pool that is filled with sharks with electric eels and, uh, you know, those old war mines, those naval mines, and stuff like that. Because anything can happen. Anything can happen. Um, and it's one of those things where you'll get to know the character through his actions. Actions speak louder than words. And so you get to know the character well before he ever says anything. Because he's out there shooting stuff and blowing stuff up and killing stuff. And you get to kind of see the kind of person he is. Is he merciful? Is he not merciful? Uh, is he angry? Is he calm? You know, what what makes him tick? Because you get to see that. So you don't need to have, you know, 28 pages of, you know, build up and dialogue most of the time. I think you can just kind of just jump into it and the audience will catch up. And here it does that very, very well. I, I think you do get right into it. And man, you start riding that pony and you look down and you find out it's not a pony. It is a Velociraptor. Um, and you are riding bareback. Okay. So it's it's one of those things where, you know, he hits it. Um, the MC, uh, Mr. Blaze, uh, is a hardcore kind of dude who kind of lets his weapons do the talking. He's kind of a jaded insofar as he's seen so much horrifying images uh, that it would make you lose your mind but it just kind of barely phases him anymore. And he reminds me a lot of the, the nameless gunfighter from the old Clint Eastwood movies. Um, you know, the guy that rides in, nobody knows who he is, and, you know, he does all this really awesome stuff, and then he just kind of rides out of town. And it's like, man, I don't care what you guys think. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. Uh, Blaze is a Marine who travels with his sister, who happens to be a witch of no small skills. And together they fight a variety of mobs. I'm, I'm sorry. Let's speak. Let's speak coming into play. It's not mobs. Uh, because this is not a little RPG book. Um, these are these are monsters. You know, or if you want to go with the aforementioned title, they're demons, they're aliens, they're werewolves, cyborgs, and spooks in general. You know, ghosty kind of stuff. Uh, there are tons of things for him to kill and only so many weapons and spells to use. Now, this is, is a book that puts action first. I think I made that pretty clear by this point. Uh, you can't write a book about a space marine who makes the predator look like Elmer Fudd hunting rabbits and have the main, you know, guy caught up in endless loops of dialogue and exposition. Crap needs to get blowed up and killed on a regular basis. And Crash knows this knows this. I mean, how could you not with a name like Crash? Seriously. Bonus, he knows how to write a fight scene. Not everybody does. Sometimes you get those real feet people that say, and then he punched the man in the schnozola. Okay, no. This is this is not like that. Um, this is a full bore, you know, uh, wham, bam, slam, crush that head under a press and keep on going without looking back kind of dude. I mean, it, it's really fun. Um, you know, you, you would almost think that Aaron Crash has been in a couple of space battles himself. He makes the whole thing plausible. At no point did I sit back and go, wow, this dude must have been high as a kite when he wrote this stuff, because it's just so insane. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there are they fight vampires, but so what? So does Harry Dresden. It doesn't make it any less believable. You know, I can suspend my disbelief. You tell me to give it up, and I, I toss disbelief out the window. The window. Not the window. The window. Window. I window. A window. A window. window. I don't know where I'm going with that. Anyway, um, 
you know, fighting the, the crazy supernatural stuff does not make it less believable if it was just aliens or if it was just killer bears. Um, it, it works. And I kind of wish he'd hop over into Stephanie Meyer's realm with her vampire and werewolf problems because I think I think Blaze could do some serious help over there permanently. Yes, I am Team Crash, bitch. Blaze is my boy. That, this, is an urban fantasy story set into space, but with more gore, guts, and blood than you usually get in a UF book. Now, the only real complaint I have after I say that is that I kind of felt like Crash might have been holding back a little bit, going, you know, rather than going for like a hard R, he kind of floats around almost in a, in a PG-13 kind of setting. And you know, I don't want to say that like, like I'm crazy. I just said all the crap that he does. But, you know, you can kill, <coughs> excuse me, kill stuff, blow stuff up, and, and it's not as bloody or as gory as it could be. And I, I think that, you know, he kind of stepped back away from that. And I was really, you know, when you 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 read or listen to War God's Mantle, you can almost feel, you know, where he's, he's wanting to go really hardcore um, and, and just heads go flying and blood goes spewing and spraying and everything else. Um, and it doesn't happen because I think that James Hunter, love you, James. I, I think he kind of reels that back a little bit. I don't think he likes to be quite as hardcore as, as I mean, like I am a hardcore kind of dude. Um, if I ever get to write a book, you're going to see uh, just, just how graphic graphics should be because I, I don't tend to restrict things. Uh, pretty visceral, very visceral. Um, because I've seen a lot. I've lived through a lot. I've done a lot. And I think it needs to be translated sometimes into the characters that are doing the fighting. Um, so, you know, um, you know, here, I think that he might have been holding back just a teensy weensy bit. Teensy weensy. But other, overall, you know, um, I have no complaints. Um, I, I think he really worked it other than that one little factor. But, you know, PG-13 can still work. I'm, I'm more of a horror or kind of guy. Uh, and I feel that way about movies. I mean, in movies, I better either if it's if it's R, there better be boobs, blood, or body parts. And if there's, it should be all three of those. And I don't mean to sound like that's that's what I go for, but you know, if I'm watching a movie, I'm paying the money for it. There better be some extra stuff because I can see everything else on regular TV. You know, Friends is funny, but it's not something that sticks in my mind as we go through life. I couldn't tell you the plot of 90% of the shows I've watched on Friends. But I could tell you The Matrix Reloaded. Not Reloaded. Oh, my God. Not Reloaded. But I could tell you The Matrix, the original, um, was just amazing with how they did things. And it, and it wasn't as bloody. You want to talk about awesome? Watch The Fly 2, where they crush a guy's head with an elevator. That. That is a hard R. Yeah, yeah that's what you need. Um, so, you know... He pulls this off quite well. You know, he keeps it within a realm of, of not crazy, gory kind of stuff. Um, but, he, but he handles he handles the story well, and it's very believable. Now, Dunsworth narration is really, and I hate to say this, uh, the only weak part. And it's not that he's bad, but I did feel his pacing was a bit faster than I prefer. I mean, if, if you listen to, go back and listen to the, 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 the preview that we give where they, they kind of talk through things. Uh, he, he's just, he's a, he's just a little faster, faster as he's, as he's speaking than I think he should be. I, I think instead of saying like, Dunsworth narration is really the only weak part. And it isn't that he's bad. I think he goes, Dunsworth narration is really the only weak part and it isn't that bad. Um, he, he kind of has this, speedy kind of quality um, and, it, and it doesn't match um, and his voice speaking of doesn't match doesn't match blaze in my head um, blaze's voice should have been you know rougher or more gravelly or deeper or deeper or gravelly you know when you can have a guy say yo i'm gonna kill you demons and i'm gonna blow up your planet and then go home and make out with your mother you know that kind of a voice that works, um, as opposed to you know when I, I get done killing you demons, I'm gonna you know blow up your planet and I'm gonna go home and make out with your mother. That doesn't quite, yeah, stick it as well as you know Mary Lou Retton landing at the Olympics. Um, he does a fine job otherwise, but I didn't really feel that connection with the MC that I usually get. 
And that's important. Overall, he does a good job, and I do think he handled the story well, but in those quiet moments, it just felt like he was in battle mode all the way through. So, slight pacing issues and my own disconnect with the MC's voice. Otherwise, solid narration. Um, solid. So, again, you know, I don't do scores, but check this out. If you are a fan of, you know, urban fantasy or space fights, then this book is going to appeal to you. No scores. No, you know, just passing out alternative reads. So go out and check this book out. It's really, really fun, uh, really exciting, and it's it's a change of pace. It's a good change of pace, and you're supporting a lit author. You know, continue his his writing in a different field for just a little bit. I'm sure Aaron will come back to do more lit later on. Now that he's finally got the War Gods Mantle Book Three released or coming out soon, I don't know when this is coming out. So. Um, I know that War God's Mantle has been spoken on Facebook about coming out soon. I just don't know the release date. Um, so it's going to be soon. So hopefully with that being completed now, um, and, and I'm not trying to say he should step away from James, but you know, maybe he should just do a lit RPG book all unto himself and see how that goes. I would love to see that happen. I would love to see you go out and get this book and support it. So give it a chance. It really deserves it. Whew. I'm going to say, I really hope you enjoyed the show as much as I did this time around. There are some really great books on today's program. Go out and give them a try. Um, you know, it doesn't hurt to try new things and new authors and, and you know, new narrators. Um, I just had a lot of fun listening to them. I don't think I gave anybody a bad review today. Um, so I know that you'll enjoy these too. I guess all I really have left to say is thank you very, very much for watching. Um, I do appreciate you taking the time to watch or listen to the show. Uh, if you want to support us, you can like the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast Facebook page or the YouTube page or just share and like the video. I sincerely, very sincerely hope that you've enjoyed the show. Please, as always, I want to ask you to leave comments or suggestions in the section below and free, feel free to tell me just whatever you like. I enjoy the feedback. Remember... You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. And again, I'm going to implore you to remember to please always leave a review for a book that you have listened to or read. Authors really depend on reviews. Very much so. Um, 50 reviews is like a key number. They need 35 three-star reviews or better to kick in some algorithms, but 50 is the golden ticket. Uh, it gets them noticed on Amazon. So if you like a book and you really want to see more, go, go give a review because it will only help your author do better and bring you more stuff. And it also lets them know that the book is going to be worthwhile investing in and writing more about. So just leave a review. It doesn't take long. It doesn't have to be extensive. I know I BS through a whole bunch of stuff and talk about tons and tons of different things. But really, you can just say, hey, this book was great. I loved it. Uh, fantastic MC. Great plot points. Get this book. You'll enjoy it. And that's all it takes. Three or four sentences and you're done. Take you five minutes. And it's worth it for an author that you enjoy. For the Little RPG Audiobook Podcast, I'm Ray. Keep listening.